Are you a small business owner struggling to nail down your brand voice? Have you hired copywriters only to discover they couldn't capture your messaging? If that sounds like you, then you need to download my free resource, Discover Your Brand Voice in Three Easy Steps. Once you complete these simple steps, you will have a solid foundation for producing your business copy, whether you decide to write your own content or outsource it to a professional, like, say, me. As an added bonus, you'll be automatically subscribed to my email list where you can learn more about my writing services and receive weekly updates about my podcast, Emotional Abuse is Real. Head over to the link in the show notes to grab Discover Your Brand Voice in Three Easy Steps today. Trigger warning, this podcast episode features discussions of domestic violence as well as emotional and narcissistic abuse. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Emotional Abuse is Real. I'm your host, Serene Leeds. I'm a professional writer and storyteller, and I'm so glad you're here. On today's episode, I'm thrilled to welcome two very special guests, Sarah Jacobs and Jamie Berger of Jacobs Berger, LLC. If you're a longtime listener to Emotional Abuse is Real, then you'll likely recognize these names. Sarah and Jamie are my first ever returning guests after they appeared on the podcast in late November 2023. As you may remember, they are family law attorneys based in Morristown, New Jersey, who specialize in high-conflict divorces involving narcissistic abusers. But as always, before we get into the episode, I have a few quick announcements. Please make sure you're following me on Instagram at Serene Leads Rights. That's S A R E N E L E E D S W R I T E S. And that you're subscribed to this podcast on either Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube. Also, don't forget to support Emotional Abuse is Real by leaving a five-star rating and by writing a review over on Apple Podcasts. I'd also like to remind you that Emotional Abuse is Real still has a Buy Me a Coffee page, and donations are always welcome. That's because this podcast is a one-woman operation, and your donations help support the podcast's production costs. If you're interested in sharing your emotional abuse experience on this podcast, please either DM me on Instagram, email me at hello at sereneleadsrights.com, or fill out my quick and simple application form. I've left links to my Instagram, email, the show's application form, the Buy Me a Coffee page, and my free download, Discover Your Brand Voice in Three Easy Steps, in the show notes. For their second appearance on the podcast, Sarah Jacobs and Jamie Berger delved into the more intricate aspects of domestic violence and how to advocate for domestic violence clients who feel the court system doesn't protect them. We also cover topics like understanding the nuances of domestic violence and narcissistic abuse, setting boundaries, co-parenting with an abusive ex-partner, and advocacy resources. I have no doubt that Sarah and Jamie's expertise will help many listeners of this podcast. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Sarah Jacobs and Jamie Berger. Welcome back to the podcast, Sarah and Jamie. I'm so excited to have you back today because you are my first return guests. And I'm looking forward to speaking with you further about divorcing narcissistic abusers and escaping domestic violence. So one of the recurring themes on this podcast is how many victims of narcissistic abuse and domestic violence feel that the court system doesn't protect them. I've had many survivors talk to me about their own terrible experiences. Experiences, And I know this is a topic we touched upon during your last appearance. So I'd love it if we could delve a little deeper today into the intricacies of domestic violence, specifically how the court doesn't always protect victims, how to advocate for clients who are victims of do- 
domestic violence and how we can all better understand the difficult aspects of domestic violence. Above all, it's important to remember that domestic violence does not always mean physical abuse. So my first question to you both is, could you please clarify what domestic violence is? Absolutely. Again, thank you for having us back. We're very excited to be, you know, your your first repeat uh, podcast this year. <laughs> so, you know, Sarah and I, we both do a lot of domestic violence work, and obviously, you know, it depends on on which jurisdiction you're practicing in, what the sure. what the actual definition of domestic violence is. But I do think it's really important to touch upon the fact that it is, it's not always, you know, in the form of physical abuse. It is a cycle of abusive conduct. It's recurring. Um, it, it can take so many different forms and it impacts so many different people. So it's, it's really, it's really important to understand, you know, if you are in that cycle, what it can look like and the many different faces that domestic violence can have. Um, there's, there's emotional abuse. There is financial abuse. Um, there are, you know, so many, you know, so many different nuances and forms. Um, of domestic violence, but really, really what, what it is, it's a cycle of recurring behavior. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not always, you know, sometimes people think, oh, you know, domestic abuse is this one time occurrence. It typically is not. It really is a, it's a cycle of abuse. Um, It's somebody who is, you know, a victim, a true victim of domestic violence is somebody who is stuck in that cycle and can't remove themselves from it. And so understanding the different, you know, the different faces, what it is and what it isn't, um, is really important. And and for for us, because we do divorce work also, right. you know, a lot of times there's some some confusion between what is domestic violence and what is what is marital contretemps, what is disagreements between spouses when they're going through a divorce, and what yeah. is true domestic violence. And that that can get confusing for people. And so making sure um, you know, really for us, what we look for when we're talking to people and clients that, you know, we think are true victims of domestic violence is, are they stuck in this cycle Mm -hmm. um, where they, you know, there's really no out for them other than the protections afforded by the the statute, the domestic violence statutes? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I really appreciate your uh, parsing the definition because I think that a lot of people, when they hear the term domestic violence, a lot of people may think, well, violence, well, my husband doesn't physically assault me, so that doesn't apply to me. So I really appreciate your explaining that it's more the pattern of, re- of recurrent behavior. Uh, Sarah, I just wanted to give you an opportunity if there was anything you wanted to add. I think the one thing that Jamie said that really sticks with me is Mm -hmm. that because there are so many different forms and because it's a cycle of recurring behavior, there's also a a mindset between like among victims that it has to be one or the other. Mm -hmm. So um, that there can't be this almost like fluidity to the way that a perpetrator commits domestic violence. And that's very untrue. Like, we have a lot of clients who have experienced, you know, uh, emotional abuse on a pervasive scale that then, you know, there are these escalations to a level of, of potentially intimidation, if physical intimidation, even if there's no actual contact. And then, you know, that may recede. And then there's a way of, of using finances and financial abuse to sort of layer on to the emotional aspect of it. And it, part of an abuser's technique is not always to be exactly the same in the way that they present with the type of violence. It's to confuse the victim. It's to keep the victim on, on, you know, off kilter and off their, their toes per se. And so it, it often is a multitude of different facets. And that leaves us in a situation where we actually have to do a lot of education with our clients because they're unclear to Jamie's point, especially in a divorce context, that something that may be happening is in fact domestic violence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much for explaining that. So as I said before, many survivors who have appeared on this podcast told me that when leaving or divorcing their abusive partners, they felt like the court wasn't protecting them. And and it was as if the, the court was siding with their abuser. Can you please explain why this happens so often? 
I think that one of the one of the good things about the court system and yeah. it is also a negative thing in this particular context, is that the court system is intended to be neutral. It's intended yeah. to be a trier of fact. Mm-hmm. It is mm-hmm. intended to be a um, arbiter of the evidence that is being presented to it. And often the evidentiary rules, while innocent until proven guilty in a criminal context and all the good things that you see on TV often strips away the emotional context and the nuance that happens in uh, specifically with cluster B personalities, narcissism, uh, bipolar, um, uh, borderline. But in addition, the idea that you have to confront your abuser in a, Mm -hmm. in a courtroom, whether virtual or in person at this point, or if you are unrepresented by attorneys face to face in a cross examination context or in a questioning context that strips away a layer of protection. Mm -hmm. And while the court system does try to build that in, I mean, specifically our offices in Morris County, we practice throughout the state of New Jersey, but there are, there are counseling sessions. There are advocates that are present in the courtroom. There's a whole host of supportive sort of backlog for, you know, a victim in that particular space, but you are put face to face for lack of a better term with your abuser. And that can leave a victim feeling like there is no buffer between them and the person who's perpetuated this violence against them. And they don't want to go through the process because they don't feel that the process has something built in for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Jamie, if you wanted to add on. I, I do. I think I think sometimes also, and I don't I'm sure other attorneys in other jurisdictions, counties, states experience the same thing that we experience here. Sometimes the mere the, the fact of delay in the court process is a big factor because especially with domestic violence proceedings, they are meant in New Jersey to be summary proceedings. They're meant to occur quickly under the statute. They're meant to occur within 30 days. And the issue becomes there's such a significant backlog. So you're you're in court, you're, you know, and, and in cases where there's a level of financial abuse or, you know, the victims of domestic violence don't have access to funds or access to their children or access to their home or access to certain things, you know, they're, they are left, you know, coming back and forth into court on multiple occasions, to Sarah's point, having to face their abuser yeah. on multiple occasions <clears throat> and not getting the the their opportunity right away to be heard. Um, and so that sometimes that just the fact that there is this backlog and delay can really exacerbate all of the issues that Sarah brought forth. Sure. Yeah. I, you know, it was hard. I, this, that question I rewrote so many times because I know it's something that people who have been on the podcast are concerned with, but I also didn't want it to sound like well, the court, the court is just not going to take care of you and like, don't even bother and you have no hope. But like you said, there's a lot of nuance to it, which is why we're having this conversation. So can we talk about like, what is it about domestic violence that puts it in such a gray area, especially in a court setting? I, I think for me, and you know, this is my opinion is, sure. um, it's a lack of education or awareness as to what a victim is truly going through. Yeah. And I think while, you know, to Sarah's point, you know, there is, there's, there's support for victims of domestic violence in the form of advocates. Yes. Um, you know, you, you do have, you do have situations where what, where it's sometimes the attorneys who are representing the, you know, alleged perpetrator of domestic violence. Sometimes it's the judges who are just not educated on what, what it truly means to be a victim of domestic violence. And so for for us, um, in speaking with clients that come to us, sometimes it's really, it's opening their eyes to the fact that they are in fact a victim of yeah. domestic violence where they thought that, you know, this was just normal um, right. and it was normal to be treated this way. And it was normal to, you know, and, and so I think that for me is where that gray area lies. And if you don't have enough people who are educated and understanding and compassionate and empathetic and know how to handle 
um, you know, people who have been victimized for so long, who don't even realize that they're being victimized. Um, that's, that's really where it, that gray area lies for me. Mm -hmm. Sarah, did you have, uh, yeah, I have, I have two pieces. I think this is something that I already said. It's the court system. and, And I say this from the seat of a a lawyer mm-hmm. with, who believes in the justice system, if you will, yes. in the process, right? There, There is a requirement to meet certain evidentiary barriers. There's a requirement that facts have to be presented in a certain way. There's a requirement that the judge has to hear certain things that meet the standard of the statute under the case law in order for that. And, and not everybody's story from a domestic violence standpoint can fit into that box and the judge has no choice but to make certain rulings, Mm -hmm. uh, both positive and negative. I I had a client who had a domestic violence restraining order entered uh, against her and the judge was actually upset about entering it because he didn't feel it was really domestic violence at its core. He felt she suffered from postpartum depression, psychosis, but there was no diagnosis. There was no doctor. There was no testimony to that effect. There was just a lot of bad evidence presented. And Mm, so the judge was reluctant and Mm -hmm. said it on the record. So it can cut both ways. I think that a judge can not want to do something, but have to do something or want to do something, but can't do something. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's a gray area, but I think the other issue too, is the fact that especially when there's a divorce involved, um, and even when there's not, when there's just children involved or financials involved and they're, you know, not married parties, you're talking about a big balancing act for a lot of these people. Mm-hmm. They, you know, maybe the domestic violence incident didn't occur in front of their child. And now they have to continue to co-parent with this person yeah. and they have a restraining order and they're doing pickups and drop-offs at the police station, but they also need child support and they don't want to anger the person any further and they want things to stop. And so the system for victims who have, you know, other interrelated aspects, yeah. sort of force them to continue to to speak and engage. And so a lot of these victims, even when they are educated, as Jamie says, and they do understand, they choose different priorities because they understand that the complexities of the circumstance are going to leave them in a situation where they're going to still have to quote, play this game, you know, yeah. and they don't, they want to keep it as quiet and as calm as possible because that's what they've learned. So even yeah. if they can be protected, they don't want to because they think that's going to create a larger problem for them down the road. Mm. So it's this like double edged sword that I yeah. think happens a lot. And and you have to choose. You have to compromise. And that's unfortunate because you can't just sit in both buckets at the same time. Yeah, I remember we talked about a lot of compromise in uh in our last episode, which is, like you said, an unfortunate element of these situations. So on the subject of education, so how can victims and advocates, when I say advocates, I mean like family and friends support, how can they better understand the nuances of domestic violence so they can ultimately present a stronger case? I think, I, I think it's twofold. Mm-hmm. I think they really need to understand what a domestic violence proceeding is. Like if they understand it's a trial, they get understand that it's an opportunity to tell their story. But I can't tell you how many times I've had to say to a client in the middle of that, like, we can't talk about that. That's a custody and parenting time issue. That's not a domestic violence issue. Or this is the face, you know, and I'm making a square because I know we're not visual in this moment. Like this is the face of the complaint and your testimony has to fit into the allegations that are inside this complaint. And there's there's a lot. And look, lay people are not supposed to know this. This is what family lawyers are for, right? This sure. Is what people who advocate are for. But yeah. There's a, there is a level of education as to what can be done, what can be said, how things need to be presented, that the more educated a client can be about that process, the more they understand sort of what they're up against, and the more they have the ability to refine their, I don't want to say their story because it's not, the, but refine their presentation, so to speak, to really speak to the issues that are involved that can get them the protections that they need rather than sort of this winding path, 
you know, in their brain, which they feel it, but that's not going to be compelling or teach the judge what the judge needs to know in this kind of situation. Mm -hmm. I also, I mean, from, from the other side, you know, the non-legal side of it, I think understanding, um, you know, to my earlier point, like what, what the impact of that type of abuse is. Like if you're, if you're a family, if you know, you're a family member or friend or support, you know, somebody in that more supportive role, you know, trying to, trying to understand what the true impact of domestic violence is, trying to understand the underlying mental health issues that sometimes, you know, are, are rampant in, in, in perpetrators of domestic violence and, you know, these, the narcissistic personality disorder and all of these other disorders that Sarah had mentioned, like what, what, what truly that means sometimes helps, um, to, to be able to speak the language when you're talking to a victim of domestic violence, because if you can't, if you can't speak their language, they, they are, they have been groomed in certain ways to pull back from relationships, to not look for support outside of their, their, their abuser. And so when they're, they're reintegrating into, um, those different support structures, you need, you need to be able to speak to them um, in a way that is understanding of, you know, what they have gone through. And I think that that's really important. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I, I wanted to talk about this because I, it's not that I, I am not giving a hundred percent support to the survivors who come on the podcast and feel like, how could they do this to me? I, I wasn't being heard. It's not that at all. But I think that the more that they understand how the process works, the less surprised they'll be and they'll be able to navigate. Uh, they'll be able to navigate their situations better because there because there's so much emotion involved. I also think that sir, victims expect perhaps by what they've been told, but also because they haven't experienced it sometimes, this sweeping change that the court Mm -hmm. can put in, that that the entry of this piece of paper will somehow, you know, change the way that they've had interpersonal relationships, change the way that people interact with them and they interact with other people. But honestly, it's these baby steps that they put in place even before they get to the the sort of like the pinnacle of the outcome of whatever they're sitting their situation is. And I think the other thing that they really should understand, and this is a hard concept. Yeah. Because especially, and I'm speaking, you know, as JB pointed out, that there's supposed to be this quick turnaround for domestic violence proceedings and and there isn't always, but they have to make a lot of decisions very quickly. Like, do they want to proceed? Do they want to settle? Should they report it? When can they report it? A massive amount of change happens in that moment if if they're the perpetrator, you know, they're out of the house, potentially not seeing their children. If they are the victim, their child's cut off from their other parent, if in fact that was the case. And so there's a lot of moving parts in this short period of time. And a lot of people are not prepared for having to make choices that quickly, especially without the education. And it's overwhelming to them. And they're trying to learn a different language that they don't understand while also making these choices at the same time. And as Jamie said, they're conditioned to retreat. And so they shut down and it becomes Mm -hmm. a place they can't do it. And so the support system, if they have baby steps for them, like, okay, here's how we can pay this bill, or here's how we have access to this, or here's a journal that you can write something down, just an easy task that they can actually accomplish so that they start kind of like, you know, a rolling stone gathers no moss, like it, it, it gets to that point where they start to have a behavior pattern that they feel comfortable with, as opposed Mm -hmm. to everything happening to them instead of them taking control over how they want to you know, take the next step. Yeah. So I want to go back to something that you, Sarah, mentioned, because it comes up so often on this podcast, which is co-parenting with uh, an ex-abusive partner. And I find that with a lot of the survivors who come on this podcast, they may have, they may be divorced, separated, whatever from that ex-partner, but 
they're still miserable because they still have to co-parent with this person and they 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 still feel like they're so alone and i know that you mentioned you know that's that's separate that's different that's that's a custody issue but i just wanted to know what you advise uh these victims and survivors uh when it comes to their co-parenting issues because it's nearly impossible for them to not have to interact with their ex-partners. Yeah, and I can I can touch on this a little bit and it's something that Sarah and I talk about very regularly in our Thank in you. our day-to-day practice because yeah. co-parenting co-parenting at its very foundation is predicated on on active productive communication between parents and that yeah. does not exist typically in situations where you have any form of abusive behavior being perpetrated from one parent to the other. Um, and so it it's a really difficult task. And it's something, you know, we we try to educate and and empower our clients to take control, um, recognize areas where you may have to communicate versus ones where you don't have to communicate because sometimes the limiting the engagement and interaction between the parents is the most important thing um, for the victims of, you know, this abusive conduct because continuing to allow that engagement allows an avenue for continued abuse. And a lot of times the perpetrators of, of, you know, specifically, you know, people with narcissistic personality disorder and these other personality disorders, they will, they will take that inroad to abuse the, the parent and it has nothing to do with the kids. It's right. just, you know, so it's really just um, an understanding of like when you have to and when you don't have to communicate. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's sometimes we'll, we'll utilize um, a parenting coordinator um, who is, you know, serves as like almost a referee to be able to call balls and strikes with, with parents who can't kind of co-parent effectively. And, yeah, and it's, you know, there's there are challenges in co-parenting across the board in in our practice. Sometimes, you know, but re- when you have this abusive element, it it really is exacerbated, and it's just about teaching the clients um, when to disengage because mm-hmm. that disengagement mm-hmm. is is something that they need to know is for their own their own good, um, and and if they allow that engagement to continue, they're just allowing that abuse to be perpetrated. Yeah. Sarah, did you have any thoughts? Yeah, I, I think Jamie's Jamie's encapsulation of sort of like step one, right? Yeah. Yeah. Learn when and yeah. when not to. But I think yeah. the other the step two is learn how when you do have to engage because there's also a way to formulate the approach that allows for a lack of um inroads, as Jamie said, right? The way that you present an email, the way that you present information, you can still be facilitating um, information from you to your co-parent without inviting a conversation about that information, nor do you necessarily need to talk about your opinions or your beliefs or your feelings Mm -hmm. while you're coordinating soccer for little Johnny. So I think that it's not only noticing when, when, and when not to, it's noticing when you have to, how Mm -hmm. to start doing that so that you have boundaries so that the information is at the top of the, the table so that you're taking the opportunity for the abuse to come to you away. And I think it's also about learning how, and this, you know, it's the hardest part, right? How not yeah. to be triggered when they do it anyway and yeah. how to react and to choose to respond or not respond as it may be yeah. so that you're almost cutting off the life source of that engagement and you're really focusing on what do I need to say and when, and I can just stop after that. Um, it's so incredibly difficult for people who, are, especially for victims of viol- domestic violence who have been trained and um, you know, conditioned a certain way, but once they get a hold of it, that alone, even if they still have to interact, is so liberating for them because they can react differently. So they then start 
seeing a world open up to them where that they don't have to have a particular feeling. And that just makes all the difference for them. Totally. I know I had one guest on the podcast who told me that she only can, uh, she only communicates with her ex-partner through a parenting app. I didn't even know, I didn't even know that those existed. So to, to listeners that, that is one option out there. So on that note, um, do you have any resources that you can suggest to our listeners about, you know, just better understanding the court system and also like what we just talked about, uh, how to better set boundaries between themselves and their ex-partner, um, I, which may just be a really great way for you to talk about what's available on your website. <laughs> Um, well, thank you for that. You're uh, welcome. But no, you mentioned the co- the the apps, and it's yeah. something that we we recommend a lot in our practice. Mm-hmm. Um, there are, there are many different iterations of that, and um, you know, some better than others, some more robust than others. But but they are a really good tool for co parenting. Um, some of them have what's called a tone meter, where they will acknowledge in communications between co-parents when something has kind of escalated. That's amazing. Um, and and oh, identify wow. that. And and when there are attorneys involved, we have, you know, we can gain access to all of those communications in a in a nanosecond. That's great. And be able to utilize them if we need to to address issues with custody regarding, you know, custody issues regarding the children or anything like that. So that is really, really um uh, you know, those are very valuable tools for people who are kind of on the other side, you know, trying to work through these co-parenting issues. Um, yeah. We do have a lot of really good resources on our website, um, <laughs> jacobsberger.com, uh, you know, just in terms of information and understanding. Obviously, we've been now on your podcast twice discussing these very topics. And it's yeah. something that Sarah and I, are, you know, while we're not mental health professionals, we are practicing attorneys. It's something that we both have really taken the time to try to understand um, these, these, you know, the patterns of domestic violence, abusive, you know, the personality disorders that a lot of times underlie abusive conduct. And so because understanding those allows us to help educate and empower our clients. So um, we do, we do often refer people to our website um, to kind of just get that you know, just some of the information that, you know, we, because we want to speak the language to them about empowering them, you know, through the process. Because to your point earlier, sometimes the process works against clients, um, but they're stuck in it. So we've got to get them through in a way that is meaningful to them. Yeah. I just want to say about Sarah and Jamie's website, their blog has a lot of fantastic informative articles that can absolutely help uh, victims and survivors. So definitely go check it out. Uh, Sarah, did you have anything to add? Well, first, thank you. I appreciate You're welcome. It. We work really welcome. hard on trying to provide uh, resources that a lay person can read and understand yeah. and that is not overly so important, but speaks to the actual experience of the client. So thank yeah. you for that. Um, I think reading, 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 listening to our podcast and look, also understanding that everything that you read and listen to won't resonate. Mm -hmm. Um, starting with just identifying and it, it's, you know, it's called the power and control wheel. It is literally the tool that is used to identify what behaviors are in domestic violence. And a lot of people shy away from that. It it has a difficult name, but it really does resonate with the, the way that domestic violence repeats itself and the pattern, as Jamie said, you know, of behavior, Um, I think also really identifying, like reading about the different types of domestic violence so that you really can identify what is just, you know, a disagreement in your marriage or disagreement in your relationship and, and what is actually, you know, pattern of behavior that is abusive in, in some nature. And I think trying to identify in all of your reading, like those baby steps that you can take in, in your day to day, even when it does feel overwhelming and it feels helpless and it feels like you don't have a support system, 
there's always one thing that you can do every single day, even if it's that same thing, just to start your own pattern of behavior of taking control so that you start feeling like you have some agency in the choices that are, you know, being made for you and and to you, you can start doing that. And I think that's really key, especially if you want to move forward and do something, you need to have that kind of You need to condition yourself to do that so that when you need to pull triggers, you're in a position to feel comfortable doing it. Absolutely. And just to wrap things up, is there anything else that you want to share to domestic violence and narcissistic abuse victims that you you want them to know about advocating for themselves? Um, I think for me, it's that um, there are there are people who want to and are capable of helping you. Yeah. Um, you are not alone. Yes. Um, there are support groups. There are, you know, there is a foundation there. And I think, I think by its very nature, because, because domestic violence and, you know, abusive contact is a form of control mm-hmm. when you lose, when you lose your self-worth, when you lose your self-esteem, when you feel, you know, like you, you are, you have no control over your life to Sarah's point, like taking those small steps to regain that we see on the other side of it. um, And it's one of the reasons that we are so passionate about what we do is because we see people come out of the other side and they are, they are empowered. Um, And so there is, there is light, there is hope, there is a, a a road through and out. Um, And I encourage people to in whatever way is meaningful to you, you know, whether it's starting small or making the call or doing something that, you know, breaks that cycle, you will be better for it. Your children will be better for it. Um, And so I really, you know, we just, we hope in some small way we are helping. You are. I, uh, well, I'll say what I need to say after I let Sarah say her final Oh, thank you. (laughs) That's okay. I I mean, my partner said it super eloquently, but I, I think the only other thing that I would add is is find one person and don't get, don't get discouraged. If the first person you reach out to doesn't understand or doesn't take it seriously, find another person, keep, keep talking to people that you believe you can trust because there is someone out there who will identify with what you're saying, be that support system to help you take those baby steps, be a sounding board, get you what you need, squirrel away your money, and and we'll work with you to get you to a place where you can break free. And just that one connection will change the face of what you're looking at because you won't feel isolated and alone. Sarah Jacobs and Jamie Berger, thank you so much for your expertise and for your passion for all of the work that you do. It was lovely having you on the podcast again. Thanks Thank again. you, Serene. So good Thank to be here. Thank you for having us. My pleasure. Thank you for listening to my conversation with Sarah Jacobs and Jamie Berger on Emotional Abuse is Real. If you would like to connect with Sarah and Jamie, I've left links to their website and social media in the show notes. I've also left a link to their first appearance on the podcast. If you would like to be a guest on the podcast, please reach out via email at hello at sereneleadsrights.com through Instagram at sereneleadsrights or fill out my guest application form. Please note that this podcast should not be used as a substitute for professional mental health services. If you are a victim of emotional abuse and need help, please call or text the Suicide and Crisis Hotline at 988 or call the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-7233. You can also text START, S-T-A-R-T, to 887 887- Eight, eight. Once again, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts. Follow me on Instagram, consider buying me a coffee, and go grab my free download, Discover Your Brand Voice in Three Easy Steps. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll see you next time.